This is your host Andre again. Part 2 of the lecture on Assyria promises to be as interesting as part 1. You will once again discover that the spade of the archaeologist casts new light on biblical truths. Francois will now continue with part 2. Relax and enjoy the journey of discoveries. You are looking at a very interesting site north of the ancient city of Nineveh called Korsabat. In ancient times it was called Dur Sharakin, which means the fortress of Sargon. Let me tell you the story of the discovery of this ancient Assyrian capital. Botta, a French physician and diplomat, started digging at a site called Nebi Yunus, which means the mound of the prophet Jonah. But the Muslims protested because they regarded the site as holy because of the shrine dedicated to Jonah. So Botta subsequently transferred his digging operation to the nearby site of Kuyun Yik, but without success. One day a talkative Arab told him that near his village was a whole mound of things Botta was looking for. He and the other villagers even built their stoves from the old inscribed bricks. So Botta and his team went to Korsabat and sure enough, what they found was far beyond all expectations. They excavated huge walls covered with strange and bizarre reliefs. Strange creatures and men with stately beards fascinated them. They soon realized that they discovered an ancient Assyrian palace. Now before telling you the rest of this exciting story, let me quote you an interesting verse from the Bible. Isaiah 20 verse 1, In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon king of Assyria came to Ashdod and attacked it. For many years scholars were very skeptical about the authenticity of this verse because it was only here in Isaiah where the name Sargon appeared. Let's go back to Korsabat. Bot and his team dug deeper and deeper and made a tremendous discovery. Guess what? It was the palace of Sargon II mentioned previously only in the Bible. As I walked through the Assyrian gallery at the Louvre in Paris, I felt so proud about the Bible. Surely it is God's word. Of all the books in the world, the Bible is the most reliable. This book should occupy more and more of our precious time. This relief says that King Sargon went to Lebanon to secure cedars for use in the construction of his palace. Long before this discovery of Sargon's expedition to Lebanon, the Bible mentioned his name. Here you see boats carrying logs down the Tigris River. To me this is much more than a study of ancient Assyria. This picture tells me that God's word is true. I took this picture of one of the restored Assyrian gateways in front of the Iraqi museum in Baghdad. The ancient city of Dur Sharkin had seven of these huge gateways. The Bible says that after a siege of three years, Samaria was captured and the Israelites were deported to Assyria. Can archaeology confirm this fact? Yes, it can. In his famous display inscriptions, Sargon summarized the first 15 years of his reign in these words. I besieged and captured Samaria, carrying off 27,290 of the people who dwelt therein. Fifty chariots I gathered from among them. I caused others to take their portion. I set my officers over them and imposed upon them the tribute of the former king. You are looking at a statue of the mighty Assyrian king Sargon II. Why did God allow him and Shalmaneser V, who died during the third year of the siege, to conquer and exile Israel? Listen to these sad words. 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 22 and 23 The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence as he had warned through his servants the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria and they are still there. 
When I visited Korsabat, where some of the disobedient Israelites eventually died, I did some serious thinking. Am I persisting in the sin of bitterness? Am I persisting in the sin of lovelessness? May God help me, and maybe you too, not to persist in harming other people. In Isaiah 20 verse 1, we read how King Sargon sent his supreme commander to Ashdod and attacked and captured the city. This is what the Bible says, but can archaeology confirm it? Yes, it can. Sargon wrote in the Assyrian annals, In a sudden rage I did not assemble the full might of my army, but started out towards Ashdod, with those of my warriors who, even in friendly areas, never leave my side. I besieged, conquered the cities of Ashdod, Gath and Asdu, Dimu. What Sargon wrote on the monuments of ancient Assyria is a direct confirmation of scripture. The science of archaeology calls you and me to study the Bible with greater eagerness and a greater respect. I had the privilege of visiting the Philistine city of Ashdod south of Joppa. Archaeologists have been excavating the site since 1962. The Acropolis covered some 20 acres and the lower city at least 70 acres. Guess what happened when the excavators came to the relevant level of occupation? They found evidences of Sargon's destruction of the city. They also found burial pits with groups of skeletons and bones of 3,000 people who probably died during the conquest of the city. Also found in the area of the Acropolis were three fragments of basalt stela celebrating Sargon's conquest of the city at the time. This stela with its cuneiform writing corresponds with a victory stela found at Dur Sharakin. This cuneiform tablet was discovered at Korsabat in 1933. It mentions the names of the Assyrian kings. With the aid of this tablet, it has been possible for scholars to reconstruct the chronology of the Assyrian kings of antiquity from the 33rd king on. Both the name and the length of the king's reign are given, including that of Sargon II. Whenever I visit Baghdad in Iraq, I usually attend this beautiful Seventh-day Adventist church. The love and hospitality I receive from these dear Christians are beyond description. We will never in this life understand how much a little word of encouragement and a little deed of kindness means to people. Especially strangers, only in heaven one day will we see the results. Dr. Siegfried Horn, then professor of archaeology at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, visited this church with its kind people in 1954. While visiting the home of one of the missionaries, he noticed children playing with a cuneiform tablet that was already broken into two pieces. When he read the script, he discovered that this was an identical version of the king list that was discovered at Korsabat in 1933. While I looked at this valuable discovery in the Iraqi Museum at Baghdad, I thanked God for his interest in us. He wants to give us more than enough proof that his word is authentic. The spade of the archaeologist can be called the handmaid of the Bible. Today we can read our Bibles in the context of the culture of ancient times and with a new confidence in its reliability. After Sargon's reign, no mention is made of the ten tribes of Israel in the Assyrian records. Why? Their kingdom was destroyed and all the inhabitants deported to different places of the Assyrian Empire. From now on, the focus is on Judah. 2 Kings 18 verse 13 In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. We want to know if the spade of the archaeologist can shed some light on this biblical information. Let's do some research. I was so excited when I visited the ancient site of Lakish. Guess why? It was one of the captured cities that Sennacherib mentions in his annals. Archaeologists excavated this stone panel at Nineveh on which Sennacherib depicts his attack on the Judean fortified city. 
Here you see them preparing for the attack, armed to the teeth. As I visited the site, I thought of the fear that gripped the hearts of the Judeans in Lakish. How could they defend themselves against the mightiest nation of the time? The artists illustrate how the engineers built their sloping ramps of earth, stones and felled trees. Look at the Assyrian siege engines. Look at the battering ram sticking out like a barrel of a cannon. The crew consisted of three men, one inside and two behind. These archers are quite safe behind their protective canopy. Look at those bows and arrows. You're looking at a scene that transpired in the year 701 BC. In addition to the conventional arrows, they also hurled stones and burning torches into Lakish. They were called the fire bombs of the ancient world and could hit any target up to a distance of 200 meters. These missiles were excavated at the main gate of Lakish where the fiercest fighting took place. God's people never lost a battle while they trusted and obeyed God. Bone and iron arrowheads killed and wounded many Israelites. Whenever Israel was disobedient, not trusting God, they lost the battle. Let us learn these precious lessons from the past experience of Israel. The Bible mentions the cruelty of the Assyrians. Here you see the evidence of how they flay their captives, taking off their skin. Look at these poor victims of Assyrian cruelty. They were hung on pointed stakes. God warned the Assyrians through the prophet Nahum that they would disappear from history because of their cruelty. Don't be cruel to people. They are God's property. Ask Him to give you a kind and a loving heart. After the capture and destruction of Lakish, the Assyrian king left this message of conquest. Sennacherib, king of the universe, king of Assyria, sat upon a house chair while the booty of Lakish passed before him. The cuneiform message on this hexagonal prism, known as the Taylor Prism, gives a graphic account of Sennacherib's military campaigns. It mentions that 13 years prior to the destruction of Lakish, he also invaded Judah but was unsuccessful in destroying Jerusalem. Listen to what he did. As to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities. I besieged and took 200,150 people. Himself I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal palace, like a bird in a cage. I increased the tribute to be delivered annually. The Bible gives us the exact amount of tribute Hezekiah had to pay to the Assyrian king. This is amazing. Let me read it to you. 2 Kings 18.14 and the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and thirty talents of gold. I have a pleasant surprise for you. The clay prism of Taylor also mentions the exact amount of tribute. And guess what it is? Thirty talents of gold. For some unknown reason, Hezekiah stopped paying his yearly taxes to the Assyrian king and this caused the second Assyrian invasion of Judah. King Sennacherib had only one aim in mind, and that was the destruction, the total destruction of Jerusalem. This is what the Assyrian records tell us. And please don't underestimate Sennacherib's military strength. In the year 698 BC, he decided to erase Babylon from the face of the earth, and he succeeded. You're looking at one of the major battles of antiquity. Some of the captives bring their tribute to the Assyrians while others prostrate themselves on the ground while they plead for mercy. Here we see armed soldiers hastening onto battle. You know, the more I study the kind principles of the kingdom of God, the more these scenes are repulsive to me. Oh, how much we need peacemakers in this world of strife and war. This closer view brings out the amazing detail of the Syrian artistry, all etched out in stone almost 2,700 years ago. 
and now this mighty army was on its way to destroy Jerusalem. After Sennacherib successfully destroyed Lachish, he went to Libna. Here he received news of an Egyptian threat by Terhaka. 2 Kings 19 verses 9 to 11 Now Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, the Cushite, that is from Upper Nile region, king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah with a word, Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? This is one of the most dramatic accounts of divine intervention in the Bible. Hezekiah took this threat of human extinction to the Lord and prayed. 2 Kings 19 verse 19 Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. After Hezekiah got up from his knees, he started digging a 533 meter tunnel. One team started at the Gion Spring, which was outside the walls of Jerusalem and the other team started digging at the pool of Siloam that was inside the city. By doing this, he wanted to deprive the Assyrians of water and at the same time have an abundant supply of water for Jerusalem during the siege. Archaeologists discovered a Hebrew inscription of six lines on the wall of the tunnel about six meters from the exit of the Siloam pool. I found this inscription in the Archaeological Museum of Istanbul. It tells how the two teams could hear the noise of the axes on the other side. But King Hezekiah also did something else to fortify the city. Isaiah 22 verse 10 And you counted the houses of Jerusalem, and you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. Israeli archaeologists discovered this wall called the Broad Wall. It was identified as part of Hezekiah's fortification against the Assyrian threat. After King Hezekiah prayed about the crisis, after he dug the tunnel and after he had built an extra fortification wall, God honored his prayer. And remember, the God who lived in Hezekiah's time is still the same today. Isaiah 37, 33 to 35 Therefore this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Every time I visit ancient Nineveh that was modernized and fortified by Sennacherib, I think of his humiliating defeat at Jerusalem. It all happened because he challenged God's ability to save Jerusalem and his people. Isaiah 37 verse 36 Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Syrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. At the conquest of Lachish, Sennacherib's ego was elevated to the skies. But at Jerusalem, he was humiliated to the grave. This defeat sent a shock wave throughout the ancient world. Herodotus thought it was a plague of mice that caused the disaster. Whenever I visit the restored gates of Nineveh, I think of the humiliated Sennacherib coming back to his glorious capital. Another humiliating shock was awaiting the king. Isaiah 37 verses 37 and 38 So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke up camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of Nisroch, his sons Adremelech and Shariser cut him down with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. 
and Esarhaddon his son succeeded him as king. For many centuries the fate of the mighty king Sennacherib was only mentioned in scripture, but the spade of the archaeologist recently confirmed these biblical facts. You are looking at the site of Esarhaddon's palace that was discovered in 1990. Listen to his account of his father's death. A firm determination fell upon my brothers. Unholy hostility they planned behind my back. My brothers, trusting in their own counsel, committed unwarranted acts. To gain the kingship, they slew Sennacherib, their father. I reached Nineveh well pleased. I ascended my father's throne with joy. I am Esarhaddon, king of the world, king of Assyria, son of Sennacherib. Archaeology has once more confirmed the authenticity of your Bible. Why? Because God wants you to read this precious book and discover his great love for someone like you. Among the most fascinating reliefs of Assyrian kings are those having to do with Ashur Banipal. The details on his prison say that he reigned from 669 to 627 BC. Ashurbanipal mentions his successful campaign against Memphis and Thebes in his prison. The booty of silver and gold he brought to Nineveh is unbelievable. Nahum 3.8 also refers to this same campaign. The Bible even refers to the presence of lions in the Assyrian Empire. Critics of the Bible scoffed at this information, but let's read it. Nahum 2 verses 11 and 12 where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the lions whelp, and none made them afraid. The biblical mention of lions remained a mystery until Austin Henry Layard and H. Rassam made some amazing discoveries. They came across these huge panels of lion hunts in the palace of Ashur Banipal. When Bible critics saw these huge portrayals of lions, they were amazed and silent. Archaeology once more proved the authenticity of the Bible. Listen to this vivid description of the Syrian chase, both in hunting and in war by the prophet Nahum. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots the horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. Nahum 3 verses 2 and 3. 2,700 years ago the prophet saw this cruel war scene you are looking at right now. These ancient finds help me to trust God just a little more with my life and with my future. This is shocking. Do you notice the heads of decapitated enemies in the hands of the Syrian soldiers? How cruel! After Rassam and his workmen cleared away the lion hunt gallery, they made their way through a passageway into a vaulted room. Before them were stacks and stacks of inscribed tablets. These 25,000 fragments represented 10,000 different texts of various shapes and sizes. The tablets which Ashur Banipal gathered from all over his realm provided scholars with an understanding of the Assyrian and Babylonian civilizations. They dealt with subjects like history, signs, religion, official dispatches, business documents and letters of all sorts. There were even dictionaries and grammars of the various languages. Many thoughts pass through my mind when I visit the sites of these ancient cities. God is telling us that he is ultimately in control of the nations of the world. God sent his prophet Jonah to call the cruel Assyrians who stuck people on poles to repentance. But alas... Their repentance lasted only a short while. Here the Assyrian soldiers are flaying people. 
they eventually forced God to make an end of Assyria. Please don't miss the next lecture on their destruction by the Babylonians. Mutilated skeletons of Assyrian soldiers caused by the collapse of the Halsey Gate in 612 BC were recently excavated. They were killed when Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and King Sahacharis of the Medes destroyed the city of Nineveh. I long for an empire where God will be the king. I long for a kingdom where there will be no violence and no cruelty. What about you? As you listen to the description of this land, please decide by God's grace to be there one day. Revelation 21 verse 4 He himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Dear listener, I personally learned that God expects obedience at all times. God also intervenes at a time we least expect it. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, it is our desire to be totally obedient to you. Help us to realize that you are in control amidst our greatest crisis and you can deliver us at all time. Amen. There is more fascinating information for you in the next presentation. Don't miss it.